I'm joined now by my peers back, socialist author Grace Blakely, the Times political sketch writer Quentin Letts, and Sky News Australia host Erin Modem. Well, welcome all of you. What a powerful pack it is tonight. Uh, Quentin, great to see you're, you. You're as deep as Ruth Kelly. Yeah. Do you remember her? <laughs> she had a very deep voice. Quentin, <laughs> let me ask you with this, this hot potato question, what is a woman? My wife. Right. She's a woman. But uh, what is a woman? I don't know. It's, it's the opposite of a man. How about that? How have we got to a place where this is even something that gets debated and people are horrified about even answering it? Well, it's a sort of linguistic terrorism uh, that's been going on and uh, absurd, and it means absolutely nothing in the real world of politics. That does... uh, as in electoral politics. It means it has absolutely no impact at all. So it's just lunacy that the elite is getting itself into a lather about. I mean, where it gets, I think, sort of more dangerous, we've talked about the, the sport issue, which I think is just unfair, but there's also, Grace, uh, that Sajid Javid has come out today and said he wants NHS website to start using woman as a term again. And the reason for that is they eliminated the word woman to try and be more inclusive, and it turned out that they were actually making it then more dangerous for people to actually get the health treatment they need. Well, presumably they changed it to avoid confusion for people who do identify as women. So well, the point being if you remove all female specific terminology, actually a lot of people who are at the lower socioeconomic range in this country at, who are already maybe confused, who don't speak English as a natural language, whatever it may be, they have even more reason not to understand what they should be doing to save their lives. So this does have consequences, kind sure, of language I mean... eradication. Like, I think calling it linguistic terrorism is a bit much. I think the vast majority of people, actually, including lots of my trans friends, actually, mm. who've spoken about this, are just like, who cares at this point about what we're calling X or Y or Z or, like, what we're labelling mm. things or, you know, all these questions around who does what in sports. Actually, the biggest issues facing trans people are the biggest issues facing a lot of other people, which are they can't afford to heat their homes, they can't afford to, you know, get good jobs that provide them with good pay and good security... They also, you know, suffer with a number of other issues, like they're more likely to get attacked and abused and all that other stuff in the street. So probably focus on that rather than all of this stuff about... So when you get asked what, what is a woman, what's your answer? Well, I would say a cisgender woman is someone who's born with female sex organs at birth and continues to identify as a woman, and a transgender woman is someone who's born with male sex organs right. at birth and then identifies as a woman later in life. I mean, that to me seems actually a very easy way of solving the problem. You call trans women trans women... I know that's fine. I, mean, I think most women would be very happy. Most being trans people I know don't really care. I think you're right. I think it's being whipped up by, as always, extremists on these debates who make it very difficult. Um, I want to come to another hot potato, Erin Modin, because you and I are going to fall out over this, because you've sent this this animal over to Wimbledon here, Nick Kyrgios, <laughs> who has got plenty of form for behaving like a beast and has excelled himself at Wimbledon already. I want to play a little clip of him in action where he basically abused everybody yesterday. Spectators who spend money to come watch us play. They should be removed. Has one person today come to see her speak? No. Like, I know you got fans, but she got none. You know, a couple lucky shots here or there, but he put himself in a position to win. Andy? Hi, Nick. Andy Dillon from... I mean, he's basically a pig. He's eating his food as he talks to the media. <laughs> he abuses a female lines woman. He abuses a, an elderly lines man. He, he abuses the crowd. He spits at one of them. I mean, the, the man's out of control. Can you put up any defence for this Antipodean monster? <laughs> <laughs> Piers, there's, there's plenty of Australians who think he's an absolute tool as well. <laughs> I'll give you the nod. And I've been one of his most vocal critics for a very long time. But I tell you what, the spitting even towards someone at their direction is appalling. The abuse of anyone in their workplace is appalling. The hypocrisy that he displays is completely appalling. He, he replied to someone on social media overnight that had taken him to task over this and said, oh, but I would never go into your workplace and abuse you. Does he think the linesmen are volunteers? That's their workplace. He's abusing them. But what I will say is it gives you Brits something to complain about. 
and you love that. <coughs> you love having someone from somewhere else to complain about and to get angry about. Well, you know and what we complain that. about. So you, know, you guys look, I actually d- secretly love this. Well, I do like a complaint, but I have to say, the thing about Wimbledon, it has this rarefied <laughs> atmosphere. It's the elite of our society. Mm. People dress up, they're polite to each other, they eat strawberries, they drink pims, they have a nice time. And then you get this guy <laughs> coming along, wrecking it all for everybody. And that unlike John McEnroe, at least was good enough to win, he's not even that good. Mm. The ego's writing checks, the yeah, body and the talent off. can't cash. <laughs> Look, look, you're right, and, and you kind of need to earn the right to be a complete flog on the court, don't you? You make a great point that if he was actually winning Grand Slams and winning titles, it might be slightly easier to just stomach. But he's entertaining. You know, he won the doubles here in Australia with his mate, the special Ks, they called them. It puts bums on seats and people watch. It's like a car crash. It's like you. Look at your ads. Love him or loathe him, you can't look away. <laughs> and that's exactly what Nick Kyrgios is. You well, know, I'm afraid despite your spirit in defence... Sometimes I look and go, oh... Aaron, despite your spirit of defence, he is winning my douche of the day, or should I say deuce of the day, given he's at Wimbledon. There we are. <laughs> Kyrgios, you're our douche of the day. Um, we'll come back to you in a moment, Aaron. I want to talk to the panel about something more serious now. Uh, the breakup of the United Kingdom, Grace. I'm very sad about what I feel is happening. I feel like it's almost inevitable, triggered by Brexit, that this sort of sense of independence now is contagious... Scotland is probably going to, in my lifetime, break away. I think Ireland, uh, we're going to have United Ireland, Northern Ireland will break away from the Union, and there won't be a United Kingdom. How do you feel about it? I feel that, you know, all of these questions are best settled by the people themselves, and I'm a great advocate of the democratic process. You know, I voted Remain, for example, but when it was clear that the country got behind leave, I was then like, right, OK, well, we need to get behind that, we need to make sure that we deliver on that, because you can't rescind a vote like that uh, if it's been, you know, subject to democratic approval. I think, you know, the same thing for the people of Scotland. If that is what they really want, if they continue to really push for independence and if Nicola Sturgeon does get that referendum, which she could do at the next election, if it is, as looks likely, uh, not um, a Conservative government, um, and, you know, Labour has to go into a a coalition with the SNP. Um, But again, you know, this is a question for the Scottish people. The fact that they continue to vote SNP in such high numbers is, I think, just as much about a rejection of the two other main parties right. as it is about independence. So, you know, we'll see what happens mm. when the actual Quinty, referendum I mean, takes It always makes me chuckle when I see the very people who are most enraged by Scotland breaking off on their own are the Brexiteers. Who I spent... think that's true. I think it is true. Okay. Most Brexiteers are pretty incensed that Scotland would have the audacity to do this, and yet the Brexiteers had the same argument. We want to go off on our own. We want to do our own thing. I don't think that's true at all. I think you're drifting a bit there because my suspicion... I've no proof for this, but my suspicion is that a lot of English people would think if the Scots want to become independent, well, let them go, because uh, the economics of the matter mean that the English and the Welsh and the Northern Irish should be better off without the Scots. <laughs> um, and I think that's the brutal uh, sort of reality of what a, a lot of, of the English uh, now would say. I think that uh, Grace makes a very good point about uh, democracy. If the Scots want to go, they should be allowed to go. Mm. And the worst thing possible would be to somehow sort of kettle drum them into a, a UK that they didn't want to be part of. But I'm not convinced that uh, the givens are all there. And I suspect that the, the Scots might decide, the Scottish voters might decide, as they did last time. To they might, stay. they might, or they might. I, I've got a bad feeling that they won't. Why do you say bad feeling though? Because I, I like the I like the idea of the United Kingdom. Well, I like the idea of us being part of Europe personally. But, but, but I mean, this I've seen not... no. But I've seen no benefit so far. Notwithstanding, we've been hit by other events. I have not seen a single benefit of Brexit so far. But I've seen the complete opposite. Oh, well, that's complete nonsense. Because there is automatically the democratic accountability benefit, and if we had not come out of the European Union mm. after that referendum, I think it would have been a scandal. The one benefit I would give it, actually, is I think the, the vaccine programme, the way that we were able to opt out of the European collective... No, but, no, but I think I'm making quite an important point here. Mm. It's if the uh, referendum result had somehow been overturned, mm. I think we'd have looked stupid. But, I mean, that's not really a case for saying that the way that the Brexit process has been handled has been good. Sure, there was a mandate to respect that democratic decision, 
but, but that's quite Brexit, important. Brexit was always this, you know, big thing was presented to the country as a done deal. Just say, vote for this thing and you'll get given it. It was never that. It was always a process. Mm. And the way it's been managed has been really bad mm. by the Conservative well, Party. Well, the same thing might happen with Scottish independence. But, you know, if the Scots vote for independence, they should be given... Well, I, I, ultimately, I, I believe, like Grace, in, in democracy... Let's talk about Boris Johnson saying that if Putin was female, this wouldn't <laughs> have happened oh, before. God. I just despair. It's like when, um, I think it was Ariana Huffington after the financial crisis said, if it had been Lehman sisters, this never would have happened. Mm. Honestly, I just find the kind of, like, the liberal feminism, and I use liberal in the British sense of the term, not in the American sense of the term, mm. where there's no attempt to kind of look at power relations, no attempt to look at politics and economics and the systems that underpin all our lives. It's just like... Women are over here and men are over here. And often, actually, it is very dichotomized as well. You're like, yeah, women are great because they're nice and sweet and caring and they look after kids and men are in the boardroom mm. and they're violent and competitive. It's all... Also, I we're always being them. told... Quentin, there have, been, there have been some <laughs> despicable female leaders Catherine in history. The great. Catherine the Great who committed actually horrors. Won. Catherine the Great, the great uh, Russian leader, actually, seized... Um, so the, 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 some of these areas now mm. being fought over uh, for Russia in the uh, when was it was early uh, early eighteen mm. hundreds, but uh, or perhaps I'm a hundred years out. However, uh, I would say this that um, I think a little bit of baiting of Putin is no bad thing. No, and also when you look at Putin, he's rather a peculiar figure. I mean. You sort of imagine him, were he a greyhound, he'd have very, very tight backside, uh, 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 back, back area. But, you know, there, there is a sort of slight sort of scent. You can imagine from Putin, if you were up close to him, be a smell of lynx after mm. there'd, there'd be a slight I smell want to of, bring in, Erin. Smell of uh, I want no, to bring back no, in. nocturnal Vaseline. You <laughs> want wouldn't bring... want to share a tent with him. Erin, very quickly, uh, we haven't got much time, but this idea that women make sort of more peaceful leaders and none of these wars will be happening, I mean, do you buy into that? No, not at all. And a quick Google of the world's most evil women, and I, I'm not trying to beat up the British here, but a lot of them come from your side of the neck of the wall. It's Bloody Mary, I think, leading the way there. But no, it, look, if he'd said that uh, if Putin had not been a narcissistic psychopath, then I'd probably agree with that more. If, yeah. if he'd said maybe if America hadn't weakened so significantly under the Biden administration, uh, Putin may not have invaded Ukraine. I believe in that more. I, I, I agree with I agree. you. I think, you know I what? We, I think we've actually reached a point of sweeping, consensus on yeah. this panel, which is highly unusual. Thank you. Grace, thank you, Quentin. Thank you to Erin in Australia. We're up here. I appreciate we're it. Every week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to end just with a few words about Dame Deborah James, aka Bowel Babe. She was an extraordinary woman who died aged just 40 last night to battling bowel cancer for five years, raising millions of donations for research. Above all, her legacy will be raising the spirits of millions of cancer sufferers around the world with her witty, sharp, and searingly honest commentaries on living and ultimately dying with a disease. She was a great lady. And she did a great job for so many people, and she will be deeply missed by this country. Thank you, Dame Deborah.